to some of these questions. We have several that we've got set up. We'll ask the audience for more input. Um, but the first question is obviously, what are some types of startup funding for early stage businesses and which businesses need them? And this, this is a good question for everybody. If anybody wants to jump in first. Christy or, or Angel, I feel like maybe you guys should take this one. Um, because I typically come in a little bit later in the in the startup phase. Okay. Okay. So um, there are a variety of types of uh, startup capital, and I will just sort of focus on um, what I call the lean years, which is those first to uh, five years of starting up your businesses. And um, you know, typically we the first thought is to go towards the uh, the lending, right? The uh, the business loans, things of that nature. But I really do encourage um, entrepreneurs that are starting up to try to find as lean options as you can um, and try to avoid as much debt as you can in the very beginning. So bootstrapping with your business, that means you're using your personal savings, um, you're using, you know, investments, quote unquote, from friends and families that, you know, they may not want back. And I shouldn't use that term investments in a, a financial a capital conversation uh, because there, it does hold a different uh, definition here. But uh, crowdfunding is an example where friends and family are, uh, you know, just making donations of sorts uh, to your business idea, to your, your funding goals. Um, and again, you know, we know about traditional bank lending that Jenny can probably tell us more about. Um, but even credit cards, you know, that's, that is an option for some of the expenses um, that, that you may have. Um, there are lots of startup competitions that um, give grant prizes away. Um, that are also, also an option and the time and energy that you're taking is to complete the application. Um, and so those are, are some of the um, resources that I like to recommend, um, you know, for those that are, that are starting up. Angel, you may have uh, some other ideas. Yeah, I, I think you listed um, a great number uh, of options and those are, as you mentioned, are um, I guess more accessible and lean. Um, so I would just touch on, I guess, give give people an even higher level overview. So basically how I think about it is um, a diluted funding versus non-dilutive funding, right? So um, that grant loans, credit card, all those great stuff Christy just mentioned fall into the non-dilutive uh, funding, which Jenny knows a lot about, so I wouldn't get into details. And then for the diluted funding, those are for the startups that would have explosive growth, right? Those are the startups we think are VC backable. Um, and then for those type of companies, you could consider to uh, start raise from like angels, um, after angels, if you have traction that you think investors would be interested in, you can consider like pre-seed Seed and then it goes on and on eventually it goes to an IPO exit. Um, but this is, um, how would I put it? It doesn't like, it, it's the, so I, I wouldn't say the more you raise or the more you borrow means the more successful your business is. It just puts more, puts uh, more pressure and time constraint on your business. So I would just, take the type of funding that works for a business the most uh, and the lifestyle you wanted to pursue the most. So it sounds like there's different types of capital depending on where you are in your business phase. So Jenny, you said you come in a little bit later on. So tell us about those types of funding. Well, so we, in terms of startup financing, we, we typically, and not to get too basic, but from a conventional lending perspective, we look at the five C's of credit, right? So that's character, capacity, um, collateral, um, any conditions, terms of the loans, that kind of thing. And then um, character, capacity, collateral, conditions. I'm missing one. Wait, let me, I'm looking at my cheat sheet here. Um, yeah, capital, sorry. So the capital part of the five C's of credit is um, 
where I think there's a variety of options, but in terms of startup financing, um, it's really difficult for a bank to come in from a conventional loan perspective in the early or in the lean years, as Christy mentioned, um, because what we need to, to do in order to underwrite a conventional loan is we need to show that there's um, the capacity. So from a cash flow perspective, that the company has the capacity to repay the loan and that there's collateral. And a lot of times both of those are missing in those in those lean years, sufficient collateral and cat and proven history or a proven track record of cash flow to, to pay back a loan. Um, so again, as Christy mentioned, your personal assets can always be pledged if you don't want to liquidate a savings or um, a savings account or you know, retirement funds, if you're if you're not wanting to liquidate that or or borrow from family members. Um, you know, you can pledge personal assets as collateral, which is one way to kind of get around it. But the the cash flow and the the proving that the company has the capacity to repay that debt is very difficult in the early years. So typically, we like to see at least two full years of performance um, out of from a company before we'll come in with a loan. Um, and I think just in the in those lean years to build a team of advisors around you to help navigate and recommend what the best type of capital or financing is for your company at, at different stages of growth is really, really important. Yeah. So not only does it depend on what stage you're at, which type of financing you go after, it kind of depends on what type of business you are as well, right? So Angel, tell us about the types of companies um, that would be seeking uh, you were using words like uh, angel and pre-seed and seed. So tell us the types of companies that you would see accessing those types of funds. Great, great question. Um, so I would say on very, very high level, um, those are the type of business you, they can scale. Um, so they tend to be tech or tech enabled businesses, um, whereas uh, more life, I wouldn't say it's more lifestyle, but where is um, some of consulting type of business or uh, labor driven, labor intensive type of business uh, may not be uh, VC backable. But of course, this is more case by case. Um, but that's how we think about it. And uh, again, the VC investors uh, who are investing like at a later stage after the angels and precede, they are looking for the 10 times 15 times returns, right? It has to be able to support that hockey stick type of uh, explosive growth. Yeah. And Jenny, if those companies aren't matching the VC backable uh, criteria, are those the types of businesses that come to Enterprise Bank to seek loans? Um, yes, I think, I mean, we see, um, we see all stages of, of growth and all types of industries and all types of companies that have a variety of um, capital structures, right? So they come to us um, a lot of times as a first point of reference because they don't know where else to go. And that's when we try to steer them into their, um, you know, other resources in their market or in their industry that can help navigate through the, the overwhelming amount of choices that, that companies have these days. Yeah. And Christy, you were talking about bootstrapping. So um, tell us a little bit more about what that can look like and how people can avoid debt when they are fundraising. Well, I think one of the biggest pieces in uh, avoiding the debt really is not trying to scale too fast. Um, you know, I always tell entrepreneurs to dream big, but start small. And so, you know, sometimes they want to you know, just have this huge inventory of items, you know, that's, you know, products that they want to sell per se, as opposed to identifying the one or two that's going to have, you know, the most value in the market right away and that they will be able to get um, the most profit from. And so, um, you know, it's either they take this all or nothing approach. And so you really do want to look at what's going to provide the, the most value to the customers. And oftentimes they overlook doing that market research to determine what is the most valuable for this particular time. And so um, timing is, is very critical. And so when we think about 
bootstrapping it is really, as they say, those boots on the ground, starting with what resources you have within your locus of control, uh, what relationships you have, what uh, mentors you have that might be able to connect you uh, to these funding um, opportunities. Um, you know, when I think about this from an equity perspective, when we look at statistics, really 61% of Black women self-fund their own businesses. And so we know that women are funded at a rate, you know, that's what I think it's like seven cents on the dollar um, on what uh, men are, are afforded when we're looking at uh, providing funding. So, um, you know, it's really just making the right decisions in your business. Sometimes it's not the best financial decision to be a solopreneur. You might have to find a partner, uh, you know, for a portion of business that you want to partner with. Um, so that you are sharing, you know, the expenses. Um, so it's just really, you know, I said entrepreneurs are, you know, resourceful and creative in finding ways uh, to, to find that find that funding. But, you know, it's really, it, if I would have known now, you know, then what I know now, I tell this story that, you know, when my husband and I started our business, we have a coaching and a consulting company and a media company. My husband and I are both entrepreneurs. And when we first started our company, we went out and bought all of the, now this was 10, 11 years ago. So you'll, you'll get a, you, you, right now you would use Square, but we didn't have Square back then. We had those credit card machines that, you know, we had to lease. Um, and we've got all these credit card machines. And now we didn't have one customer. We didn't have one client, but we had, we wanted to look like entrepreneurs, right? So we wanted to look like we had all of the equipment that we needed, all of the collateral, the business cards, you know, the, uh, the office space, and we didn't have anybody to come into it. And so you really have to look at what the true need is by looking at your expenses. And so, um, um, that that's sort of how I look at uh, a bootstrapping. <laughs> uh, Christy, you said so many things that there. We could create separate webinars on most of those topics when it comes to <laughs> equity and uh, bootstrapping just in general and uh, customer discovery. Like we, we could create a whole series on that. But um, when we think about the fundraising process, Angel, with the companies that you work with, tell us what the fundraising process looks like for the companies that are seeking like the venture capital backing. Sure. So usually um, they would start with the family and friends round uh, or pre-seed round when they have, um, uh, they, used, they used to just need an idea, but now like as there's more capital coming they kind of need a MVP, like minimal viable product now to raise a pre-seed. Um, and then as they uh, prove they can hit the milestone they uh, pitched to the pre-seed investors, it will give more comfort to the future investors. And then seed investors will come in and then usually those checks will be around like a million, two million at a valuation around 10 million. Of course, this is just on the ballpark age really changes case by case. And then after that, you will find like product market fit and then you have a vision about scalability and then you go on to get series A, B, C, D, E um, to scale it further until an exit, which is usually an IPO or MDA. And the analogy we usually like to use is um, running a startup is kind of like a, a pilot driving a falling plane. Right. You know the direction you're heading towards, but at the beginning, uh, like, but at the beginning, you have a lot more certainty than toward the end. So one, two things in my, uh, entrepreneurs do uh, is one, to find the fuel, to keep driving and have the wrong way for arrow and figure out the direction you go. And as you have the fuel, you figure out the direction, you figure out, okay, like how I should drive this plan better. So you have more um, certainty to, to figure out what's the direction or like how exactly you can get there. So it, during this process at the beginning, when the investors chip in, um, it will be smaller size um, at a higher, um, and they will expect a, a greater multiple because they're embracing a greater risk. 
And as you find more fuel, more people believe in you and hit your milestones, figure out the direction to get to your uh, destination, more and more investors will follow, will join your journey. So that's how I think about the uh, fundraising process. And Jenny, for the companies that you work with, what does the process look like for them when you're working with them? So again, you know, going back to the, the five C's of credit, it's amazing how much that plays into my life. But um, you, you, we always take into consideration um, the growth goals that the company has. Uh, they'll come to us with a plan or a firm loan request. They know the amount that they need and for what. And a lot of times that's it's easier from um, a manufacturer's perspective because they know they need to buy Yo. certain equipment <laughs> and they know they need to, they know the amount that they need to borrow for that. So they'll come to me and we'll, we'll put together a package or, or try to come up with ideas of different ways that they can obtain financing. We utilize the SBA a lot for small business lending. Um, so we just put together a loan package and then it goes through our underwriting and approval process here at the bank. And we kind of tweak things along the way. And, and, um, I mean, that's, that's, it's basic, but that's the process. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, so for all three of you, you all work with different types of companies, but how do you help companies or how should founders determine the valuation of their company? Like that's a really hard thing to determine. And how does that change during the different rounds of funding? Um, whoever wants to jump in first on that one can jump in. I can, um, I, I can, oh, go ahead. go ahead. Okay. I was going to say for me with working with established companies, we always recommend when times are good and, and not stressful um, that they get a valuation on their business because then they have an idea going forward, what the, the company is worth. And if there's partners involved, it really does level the playing field a little bit, um, especially if they've gone out and they've gotten um, an equity investor of some sort, and there may be now established and wanting to buy that equity investor out. Um, that for, for me to, I always recommend that my clients get the valuation um, at some point throughout the life of the company, but not when they're sitting in a hot seat trying to negotiate a buyout or something like that. So I'm sure it's totally different from Angel and Christie's perspective. Um, that's very helpful. So for us, uh, I guess it's more of an art than the science that Jenny just described. Um, and it's more of an art as the company, um, if the company is earlier. Um, but normally, uh, in general, we use uh, comparable companies. So we take a look at um, companies who are in a similar space, uh, have similar amount of traction uh, and team um, profiles to get a sense of, okay, how general those businesses are valued in terms of um, revenue multiples. But as I mentioned, this is more <laughs> about art than science. There's a lot of room for negotiation. Um, for example, if you have a, a very strong team or if you are uh, raising capital at a pivotal, as a topical window, for example, um, multicultural and women entrepreneurs are having an amazing fundraising window right now, given the recent attention to EI, and then potentially the valuation will be a lot higher uh, during this window. Um, but again, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it's not necessarily true that the more you raise or the higher valuation you have um, means the better your business is, um, because it's really a trade-off. You have to understand um, okay, by get, getting a higher valuation, what is the key milestones the investors are expecting for the next round of raise? And is it actually realistic to hit the milestone within the time constraint? Um, so overall, I would look at the industry um, average or median uh, and then negotiate uh, with your investor. Um, uh, use that as the base case. Christy, how about your perspective? Okay, that's what I was going to. I'll piggyback off of what Angel was saying. Again, I'm working with, you know, 
baby entrepreneurs starting up validating ideas, still testing out uh, the market, you know, whether their product is viable in the market. But, um, you know, just a lot of them don't even realize that you can take a look at these industry medians to see, you know, what the value, potential value of this business idea is going to be. And so as you're growing your business, you can sort of gauge it um, if you're going to meet that space of uh, being able to, you know, reach that same profit that um, that industry typically, you know, would have. And so, Oftentimes, entrepreneurs sort of, sort of start off without the end in mind, uh, where they're even thinking about what the valuation would be, um, you know, for their business. So, you know, those are um, the entrepreneurs in those spaces that that I am working in. Uh, they're not even at the point where they're really, really ready to look at that. Um, they're still validating ideas about their business. I would. So for, oh, go I ahead, would, Jenny. Jenny. I would follow up with that saying in part of the whole business planning process, um, looking at industry standards, as they've both mentioned, um, and coming up with projections to see if those numbers um, that are out there as industry standards can even be achieved based on the expenses that any individual entrepreneur might experience. And I think going through the exercise of projections can also help to take conceptually the ideas and put them down on paper in a number format that helps them realize the value, uh, the hard value I'll say that's in there because a lot of times what we deal with is the pride factor in what a lot of entrepreneurs feel their company is worth and, and putting the numbers down on paper kind of helps um, sometimes mirror those two and sometimes just bring them a little closer together. So projections is always a recommendation that I make and is a requirement of the SBA when financing. So for early stage entrepreneurs who are thinking about startup capital, the different types um, and thinking about projections, are there advantages and disadvantages to utilizing startup capital? I'll, I'll kind of kick off here. Um, yes, the answer is yes. Um, you know, I always say it just depends on how much you want to be involved in your business and how much you want an investor to be in your business. <laughs> because, um, you know, the investors have a seat at that table. Um, and so they are that silent partner sometimes, and sometimes they are not so silent. Um, and so you really have to make that clear distinction as to, you know, whether you want to control the growth of that business, or if you want to give up that control, um, you know, to, to that investor. So it, it's really something that you have to think carefully about. Um, it is not, you know, investments are not just free money. And so it is a contract of sorts, and they are long-term relationships. <laughs> so um, you have to think wisely about whether or not that's the best decision for you. Yeah, I can piggyback on what Christine just said. Um, I 100% agree. Um, but I think on, particularly on the VC uh, capital side, it really depends on the type of investors you're working with, right? Because um, the top tier funds or there are funds that are a lot more hands-on, they can be a great resource to you as well. For example, by introducing you to potential clients, prepare you for the next round of funding, um, et cetera. So I think that's pros and cons depending on the type of investors you are working with. Um, but absolutely with the investor on your cap table, you will give up ownership and a lot more control. And also, as I mentioned a few times, um, you will have pressure, time pressure um, to accomplish the milestones you promised at the beginning in order to raise the next round. So that would be another con. Um, but apparently, the, there are a lot of pros. You would get large amount of capital within very short of time to turbo um, um, to accelerate your business. Um, so that's number one about the capital, and I mentioned about the resources. And three, like a lot of investors have excellent PR resources. For example, for Morgan Stanley, all the companies we selected would get a chance to be on our. Um, huge 
building signage in uh, Times Square. So uh, for because of that publicity and a lot of news uh, release, they actually would get a lot more requests from um, future customers and investors as well. So I will also uh, take PR resources into consideration. Good. Uh, we've talked at a high level about all these different options, but if we can get down to a little bit of the nitty gritty. So Jenny, you mentioned SBA early, so earlier. So can you tell us, first of all, what does SBA stand for? Small Business Administration. Fantastic. Um, and when people are trying to pick between the different types, so SBA or a conventional loan or going the equity route, how do people decide what's the best method for them? And, and this is going to be open to everybody, but we'll start with Jenny. So um, the SBA is, is a great resource for small business lending. Um, it is, they have, they basically have two programs. They have um, a 7A program, which is more uh, for working capital purposes. Um, I say like permanent working capital. So to take companies from one level to the next level of growth that they want to achieve. Um, and that is primarily a great resource for that stage because as I mentioned earlier, when a company wants to go from, let's say a million dollars in sales or a hundred thousand dollars in sales to a million dollars in sales, um, they probably don't have the collateral to back it. So what the SBA does through their 7A program is they provide the bank a guarantee up to 85% in some instances of that loan amount. And that just gives the bank comfort level to go ahead and, and underwrite and hold that loan. The loan is with Enterprise Bank. The SPA just provides us with a guarantee. So um, it gives us a little comfort level when there is a lack of collateral or possibly it's a projection-based loan for a startup company, that kind of thing. Um, so that's a great resource. And then the other resource is the 504 program, and that's more for equipment and real estate financing. And that, that is an actual split loan. So half of the loan is with the SBA. Um, the other half is with the bank we, and then 10%. So it's a 50, 40 split with the SBA and the bank and then 10% from the, the company in equity. And the reason that that's a great program versus a conventional loan is that most banks will typically require between 20 and 25% down on equipment and real estate. So it's less cash out, which is great for those lean years, as Christy mentioned. I'm going to start using that, Christy, a lot. I like that term. <laughs> um, uh, so it, it's less cash out initially, which is great. And then the SBA, both through both the 7A and the 504 programs, offers very low rate long-term fixed rate options. So most banks will do anywhere from three to five years on a fixed rate and the SBA goes up to 10 and sometimes 20 and 25 year debentures on the 504 program in a fixed rate. So it's, there's really a lot of benefits, um, especially to companies that are starting out that need that boost to get them to the next level. Yeah. Absolutely. Go ahead, Christy. Okay, I was just gonna say, um, from what from what I recall, there's also the uh, the express loan, which is sort of a micro loan opportunity. I believe it's up to about three hundred fifty thousand. It's um, yeah, it's he, part. It's the seven A express. Okay, and they just raised they just raised the the express limit. So okay, um, I think they're up to up to like five hundred thousand. Oh, even better. Even better, but that's sort of for the same. You talked about for the working capital, equipment, things of that nature. And as Jenny said, you know, it's less cash out. You know, you don't have to pay that same, uh, have that same down payment per, 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 up available. But what I would also speak to is utilizing the SBA as a mentorship resource as well, because not only are they, do they provide those lending opportunities, but also the, that financial literacy piece that helps you maintain and steward the investments in the capital uh, that you have been given. So utilize the SBA in, in all of its glory <laughs> because, um, you know, what we forget 
in as in entrepreneurship is that you know this is a relational right this is a relational situation and so uh, the more um, networking you can do the more connections you can make the more questions you can ask you will be introduced and have access to more resources than you can even imagine so utilize the resources that are available um, so that you can stay in front of those capital options um, that you have in place yeah, and the other great thing about the SBA is that they're really looking for, um, uh, you know, job creation and job retention. They were obviously the ones behind the whole PPP loan funding uh, during COVID, um, but that's truly from a, a, a perspective of, of job creation and job retention, and that's why they're willing to come in and take some risks on some of the you know, less um, on some of the more risky lending options that companies have out there. So they, you know, they're all about, so they, they, they get picky and they want to see exactly what you're going to utilize those funds for and how you're going to spend the money. And, but again, it's from a perspective of job creation and then job retention. Um, but if you show them that that's what, that's what you're going to do and, and here's your ideas and here's how you're going to get there, they'll come in with that guarantee for us, which is great. And they'll come in with long-term financing for the client, which is even better. Those are such valuable resources. So Angel, for the clients that you work with, how do you help them decide what the right method is for them? Because people in your space are looking more at things like equity, convertible notes, safes. Like how do you decide, how do you help them pick between those different things? And you might give us a high level about what each one of those means if you can, like really broadly. Sure. So, um, com so safe and comfortable notes, I would put the, them in the one camp because initially when you send the paper, it's that it's like small, right? It's the, the investors don't have ownership of your company yet. And then the other part is um, equity, like price round equity. And then how comfortable notes and safe work is, um, so once, so initially it exists as that. And then as your company hit, hit the milestones that you promised to have and have the type of valuation, uh, usually in price round, um, then those notes would be converted into equity. So it gave the investors, I guess, some safety net to lend you loan at the beginning. And if your company cannot be achieve the, I guess, growth profile you, you think you could achieve, then they would take their principal and invest, uh, interest back. But if it, it also gives them the opportunity to participate in the upside. So if your company actually ramps up, their ownership would be converted into equity. So, so that's the definition and how it works for a comfortable loan. And then how do you, I guess, choose between those two types? Uh, I think you will only have that question at the beginning of the fundraise when you are like pre-seed, seed, or even A, because for the future rounds, it's more like price rounds. So it's usually just all equity, then you don't have to worry about that. So when you have to worry about this question, there's no right or wrong answer. It's not a formula that you can plug in to decide which one to do, uh, but I can tell you the pros and cons of those two types. So for comfortable notes, as we just described, it doesn't have a valuation set. So it, you can move much quicker uh, when you raise this round. And then the paperwork, um, the amount of time and the energy you spend on paperwork with your lawyer, which also related to the cost of the paperwork, will be much lower. So the entrepreneurs can move much faster. That's why it's usually used at the DC, like for early stage companies. Um, and then for equity round, investors will know how many shares they have, what the price of each share. So it gives you a much cleaner cap table. So it's usually more like investor friendly. Um, and on the opposite side, it will be a lengthier process. You need to de decide on the valuation. You need to get all the investors buy in. It's, it takes more time, costs more to go through that process. So it really depends on what you and your uh, mainly your lead investor want um, there's no answer about oh which one is absolutely better than the other one is 
just two different instruments uh, for uh, for you and your investors to consider. So as a follow on question, Angel, I think this is probably mostly for you, but at what stage do you recommend startups to start looking for VC investors for a series A? Got it. So I wonder, um, are, have you re, have you raised the seed round yet? Of, that, that was from Uri. So Uri? Uri? Not yet. Not okay. yet. So great. Um, so I, how should I answer this question? Because it's a build up process, right? So um, if you actually think you're going to pursue the VC investing broad, then you will start with like pre-seed seed and then that leads up to A. But usually for A, series A profile, um, investors usually invest um, three to like 15 million uh, at a valuation of 10 to 30 million. So if you think your business valuation is in that range, um, then that's the time for you to consider a series A race. Um, and on the more qualitative um, level, so usually a, a company already figure out product market fit. What, what I mean by that is not only customers want to buy your product and services, you also know why they're buying and what are the levers you can turn on to get to the next level. So um, that's the type of company who are usually, um, we say they figure out product market fit and they're ready for uh, Series A. I hope that's helpful. That was a good question. Thank you, Uri. I've got another question from a participant, Kai, who has been told that salary and labor expenses are some of the most difficult to accurately accurately project for a startup. So um, I, this is probably something for all three of you, but I'm going to start with Christy. Any tips or best practices for those projections? Yeah, I was looking at that question and what came to mind for me is that you really don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, Jenny talked about those projections uh, that you can look at. The SBA, again, has those by industry. Um, you know, you can look at what's already out there to sort of, um, and then Kaufman Foundation is a really good resource too um, in our area for, you know, financial resources, research, on particular industries and things of that nature. But, you know, just looking at, you know, how much time you're investing, what are, what are your costs? You know, just some of those simple formulas uh, will help you also determine, you know, what, um, what, those, what that salary would be and how to project for that. Um, Jenny, you may have a better formula than I than that, but that's, that's sort of what I have seen. Yeah, I think, Christy, I think you hit, I think you hit a lot of the, the really good ones. There's a lot of public information out there on salaries and ladders and pay scales and things like that. And then a lot of times, you know, the labor rates are dictated by the industry that you're in if, and, and the type of business that you're in. So um, I would say just utilize um, any online or, um, you know, web-based pay scale service that that's out there or, or any industry specifics that you can find. Yeah, and I would also ask uh, entrepreneurs in your field, uh, <laughs> have those people in your circle and ask how much they paid. And if it was a hard negotiation, we will give you a lot of insights in how the labor market looks like too. I think that's an awesome point, Angel, just to rely on those around you and people who are doing uh, similar things that I think one thing that I'm getting from everything that the three of you have said is the um, ability to talk with somebody and find resources and rely on others to navigate this process. It's not something that anybody can do alone. I liked what Christy was saying earlier about um, being a solopreneur is hard and maybe not the best idea for everybody. So um, taking advantage of these types of resources through things like um, Angel, the incubator that you work with and Christy, your coaching of startups and generally you're advising throughout the financial process. So I think this has all been really fantastic information. I've got a couple of other questions that we had come in through registration that I want to get to. So the first one is just really quickly, are there any particular industries that are more likely to get funding than another? Or does it matter what industry you're in and you just have to, you know, keep at it to, to find what you're looking for? 
Well, I will say um, before these other ladies weigh in, I will say that it's critical to find your target, right? Um, so that you know who's willing to invest and who's willing to buy from you, who values what it is that you sell. But from what I've seen, it is product great product based businesses, um, tech businesses, and those that are less risky. I mean, just you know, to keep it simple, those that are less risky. Um, I think the ideal um, conventional banking client does not fit the entrepreneurial mold necessarily. Uh, you know, we like the slow, progressive, steady growth um, with product-based assets. Um, but I will tell you that that I have in my portfolio of clients and in my relationships, I have um, everything from service companies to um, um, and it's by service, I mean, I don't just mean tech. I mean, we do healthcare, we do tech, we do um, a myriad of service-based clients. But then I also have the manufacturers and then I have the high sales growth clients. And, um, you, you know, they really, it really does run the gamut. And we try, you know, obviously as a, as a bank, we try to fund um, equally. You know, we don't give preferential treatment necessarily. Some deals are easier than others, but we don't turn anyone away necessarily, so. Angel, your perspective yeah, on that? Echo, yeah, I would echo what they just said. Um, there's no particular industry that's way better than the others. So obviously, like if it's tech or tech enabled, it's easier to scale. Uh, so the VC investors will be more interested in those type of companies. But again, I think any good business is able to uh, raise capital, right? Is able to find people believing in a company and bet on your business. So I would not decide what type of business or what industry you want to operate in based on how easy it is, if it's easier for investors to invest in your business. Um, yeah, I think yeah, the I passion too, and the fun, fundamental of business is uh, a lot more important. I will say too, you know, we're we're in the relationship business, so the character of the of the people that we do business with definitely weighs in on our on our decision um, whether or not to extend credit to a client. So the 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 ideas can be great, the business can be successful. But the, at the end of the day, the relationship with the business owners or those entrepreneurs or the investors is really key um, in, in the, the bank obtaining a comfort level with extending additional credit to that client. Mm -hmm. It's I mean, sort we of run personal credit scores and things like that, too. So that all falls under that C um, in credit of character. So. Yeah, I was just going to say it kind of takes me to that adage that people do business with who they know, who they like, and who they trust. Right. And as you've shared, Jenny, that is even true in, you know, operations with businesses, with, with uh, banking institutions, um, with organizations that do connect you with um, angel investors. And so your character is critical. Um, authenticity, people can read right through that. Um, there are certain um, characters that are, are not as advantageous when you are seeking a relational capital, uh, as well as financial capital, and that's arrogance, and that's um, a lack of being coachable. Um, so those are some of the characteristics that will, are going to get you further. Uh, if you are curious, if you are open, um, if you are flexible, um, if you are uh, willing to, again, being coachable, willing to take advice, as I said earlier, it's it's all about timing. And so sometimes that business plan is not as thorough as it could be. Sometimes it just takes one minor tweak that you can make to rethink uh, that business idea that's going to make it more viable for you uh, so that you have a better chance of getting the capital uh, that you're seeking. And so um, keeping in mind that it's not just about, I love what Angel and, and Jenny said about, you know, not just being led by this drive to get that capital, but but being led by that purpose and that passion behind that business, because that's what's attractive to individuals, because they know that if you are passionate, you are committed to this process, because it is a grueling, I mean, it's fun.
fun. It's amazing because you're motivated because you see the fruit of your labor, but it is a work. I mean, it is work. You know, my husband, I'll say things like, man, this is so hard. He's like, yeah, that's why it's called work. It's not easy. And so you have to truly uh, be committed to that. And so uh, just a little bit of insight around, you know, not just being so focused on, you know, just getting that money. People look at, you know, people entrepreneurs are people business is personal and so you're going to be selling to people you're going to be communicating with people and so the more you can sharpen those interpersonal skills the better better you know in my perspective and, and i will say too i think um you know knowing your story knowing your why plays a big part in obtaining a relationship with an investor or a banker um you know we always i I always tell my clients, your numbers don't have to be great all the time. If there's a story behind it, that's just as important as having, you know, success. So I want to know your story. I want to know that you know your story and, and, and I want you to have a basic understanding of how your, the, your financials work and, and, um, having the story behind those numbers and, and me knowing that, you know, the business well enough to know how in, things have impacted, you know, certain environmental changes or economic changes and how, how that impact has impacted your business. That's all very important to me, regardless of what the numbers actually look like. Those are just some good life lessons. Those, those mm -hmm. types of relationship building skills and interpersonal skills that, that you two are talking about, that applies outside of seeking funding for a, a business. So actually, uh, we have a follow-up question um, from Dave on Ty's question. Um, but during the MVP phase, there's a lot of conjecture that is likely to change over time. However, every investor wants to see a five-year projection. What are the biggest things that you will look for in the five-year projections, especially when they're that early stage? Um, I can't start. I would say exactly what Jenny just said back to you, uh, the rationale behind your projections. So what happened to the investors uh, on the other side of the table is once we get your projections, we're going to haircut your projections anyways. Sometimes it's 25%, sometimes it's 75%, right? So we know nobody knows exactly how the company is going to perform. So don't get stressed about being 100% accurate. But we do want to see is, we want to see the, invest, uh, the entrepreneurs are very thoughtful. You know exactly why you're projecting at 5% and what are the drivers behind the 5%, right? Um, so though, and for example, like using Jenny's example, if you have a down year because of COVID, why is that? Do you, how do you see it's adjusted back, right? So um, your thoughtfulness behind the numbers is what uh, investors are really looking for. And I will say, um, especially when it comes to the SBA, their projection-based lending requires that you submit at least three years of projections. And the first year has to be broken out month by month. So they want to see if there's any seasonality or if you're projecting any type of seasonality in the company. And then the, the subsequent years two and three, they, um, they just want to see on an annual basis. And the biggest thing that they look for is you need to submit your assumptions that you utilize when, when coming up with the projections. So you list out what you're assuming, and then that way they have a better understanding. So it's not, they, they don't hold your feet to the fire necessarily on hitting those projections as long as there's an understanding of the assumptions that were used to develop them. Christy, any perspective yeah, that, from you, Christy? Sure, that's what I was just going to kind of speak to the seasonality of it. Um, I, I, I just kind of want to really just piggyback on knowing the story behind those numbers. Um, because again, you know, business is not predictable because you're selling to people. <laughs> people are not predictable. So it's so easy to lose sight of the, hum the humanity behind the business. And so uh, just being authentic and honest 
uh, and having a clear understanding about that story behind those projections. That seasonality piece was huge. I was a part of the SBA Emerging Leadership Program, and um, they provided us rigorous, rigorous training where we had to incorporate live cases where we brought in some of those business challenges, where there were months that, you know, we might not have, might not have made, you know, the, the amount of profit that we made during other particular months. But how are you uh, projecting to, to meet that balance? balance, right? To make that balance. How are you looking at um, meeting those shortfalls? And so just really being creative and uh, making sure that you're not going to, you're going to, you know, that you're going to come out on top um, through, the, through those five years would be, you know, what I would encourage you to be aware of as you're, you know, speaking to those projections. This has been so fantastic. I know we've got a couple of people that are going to have to jump at four. So before we wrap up and go into breakout rooms to facilitate that networking and relationship building, let's have each of our panelists uh, give us one piece of advice to early stage entrepreneurs as they start on their funding fundraising journey. So Christy. Okay, so for me, and it's kind of the running joke, um, I'm newly working in the financial industries, uh, you know, in the financial pro uh, professional industry, and we have so many conversations about those numbers. So, you know, I would always tell my husband, we're talking about the numbers again, because listen, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a creative entrepreneur, I am so right brain to learn about these numbers. That's why it is hilarious to me that I am sitting here on a capital panel, because I always pass the... <laughs> pass the, the baton to some of my left brain friends to help me figure this out. But you have to know your numbers. You have to know that. You cannot just rely on someone else to understand your cash flow statements. You cannot just rely on someone else to do your budgets. You have to know your numbers. And there are people, organizations, groups, talk to your friends that can help you uh, understand that. But that is something that you have to do for yourself. Excellent, thank you. Angel, your advice? Sure, I would just echo what I mentioned, make friends. <laughs> um, because it's a really, really tough journey. Uh, I know by working with the entrepreneurs in our lab and also I founded a um, women network, uh, a network for women professionals as well. So I know uh, it, it's just a, such a tough job. Um, and I, relating back to the, analogy I used at the very beginning. Everyone is driving a falling plane, right? And nobody really knows the direction or how to exactly get there. So, um, but everyone is trying to gather information, attending webinars like this, trying to figure it out. So your peers' resources are actually really, really valuable in terms of getting to know the labor expense or like what investors to talk to or when to reach next round, what questions they ask you. So definitely pick their brain. And also it's just great to have that network to have a founder's talk, right? Because it's just very stressful. Um, and relating it back to raising capital, if you have founder friends who already raised capital, so if those entrepreneurs put in words for you, that warm introduction way a lot more than any other type of introductions that you may have because investors know Founders are the very unique, species, um, I guess, species that just knows how to run companies and tackle all those difficulties, and we trust their words a lot more. So definitely um, leverage the resources from, um, from this entrepreneur center and also all the other entrepreneur friends around you. And Jenny. So two hard ones to follow. They took a lot of great, um, great ideas. I would say for sure, know your story, know your why, um, and be able to, to talk about your story comfortably and with confidence and just build a great network of people around you to help um, and, and rely on. And I think Christy said it earlier, don't uh, recreate the wheel, rely on the successes of people that have come before you and and learn from their mistakes and their successes and move forward from that point. Fantastic. This has been an excellent panel. We are gonna have breakout rooms because we do wanna facilitate networking and relationship building. That's a big part of who we are at the Scandalaria Center. 
Um, so for the speakers and the Scandalary staff who are still here, um, we are going to open up net or, uh, breakout rooms and the participants can choose the room that you want to join. Um, it'll show up at the bottom of your screen at some point once those rooms are opened. Um, but Angel, Christy, Jenny, thank you so much for your insights and for being on this panel today. We really appreciate it. Um, if you're willing, please drop your email in the chat or your LinkedIn profile so people can connect with you directly.